<laughs> okay, I'm good to go. Saving the cat for the for the good bits. Exactly. Yeah. All right. So, anyways, uh, before we begin, I just want to quickly introduce our two guests today. Here we have Steve Cowan and Adam Chickalitti. Uh, both are renowned Canadian-born classical guitarists, and they each have their own extensive performing, recording, and teaching careers. Individually, they have their fair share of accolades from various guitar competitions, magazines, and even the CBC. And together as the CC duo, the Cow and Chickalitti duo, these two powerhouses of the guitar world have toured all across Canada and the United States, performing their extremely fresh programs made of newly composed and newly arranged repertoire. Their debut album, Focus, won Classical Recording of the Year at the 2021 East Coast Music Awards, and their success has only continued from there. In 2023, they won second place as a duo in the GFA, which is the most prestigious guitar competition in the world, and they continue to carve out their place at the forefront of new music for guitar, with over two dozen commissions and premieres of Bleeding Edge new guitar music. So, now that I've buttered you guys up and introduced wow. the viewers, <laughs> thank you. Awesome. Welcome. It's nice, nice to have you guys and cats. Nice to be here. Yes, yes. It's great to yeah. see you again. Yeah. All right. So, to start things off, I figured we'd get the most difficult and important questions out of the way first as, as an icebreaker. So, are you, are you guys ready? Always. Okay. So, what music will be playing in the background? If you were riding into battle on the back of a dragon. You want to take this first, Steve? <laughs> if I was riding into battle on the back of a dragon? Yeah. Um, probably I, something I'd play like... I'd surgeon for sure. Yeah. I was going to say something really uh, like sludgy um, and dark and loud. Um, slow and epic. Slow, epic, sludgy, down-tuned, really low. Like yeah. drop Z, drop Z. <laughs> <laughs> as gent as um, possible. Yeah, yeah. But yeah, again, a little on the back of a dragon. Yeah, I'll, I'll stick with that. <laughs> Adam? <laughs> yeah, I'd play, I'd play Surgeon, man. So if, for okay. people who don't know, Surgeon is Steve's uh, alternative rock band. Uh, he heavy it's loud a, band. It's a heavy instrument. Basically what I just described, but I didn't <laughs> want to say my own band. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, but nice. you know, Perfect. Uh, we've done. Yeah, it works for it works for dragons and battles for sure. Yeah, yeah I think I think so. It's got it's got, a, it's got a, again a darkness and a mystical element. Yeah. All right. <laughs> so, anyways, <laughs> but, I'm just curious, a, what would you choose, TJ? What would I choose? Uh, probably, probably something just I don't know, like either um, either something like pinball wizard, or um, maybe just something just like completely ridiculous, like. I don't know, like like a meme song or something, like Nyan Cat. <laughs> nice. <laughs> the Ravel Pavan, maybe. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Soothe the hearts before you tear them out. <laughs> right. Anyways, so uh, <laughs> on to less serious questions. Uh, how, did, uh, how did you two meet and what made you guys decide to form a duo in the first place? Uh, you want to take it out? Yeah, sure. Uh, I mean, we're, we're pretty used to answering this question. We've, uh, mm -hmm. we've been friends for about just a little over a decade. Uh, we met through a mutual friend that uh, studied at the University of Ottawa with, with myself. And uh, he, Steve actually played in a duo with Frank, uh, Francois Bergeron, um, before he met myself. And uh, around 2014, we played in a trio together with another one of our mutual friends. And then the trio member moved away to Australia. So Steve and I were just left with each other. <laughs> um, <laughs> and and so to clarify, way, Frank, the first guitarist, uh, he he left guitar to be a to be a farmer and uh, and do some other things. So yeah, me and Adam were just left with each other, unfortunately. Yeah, yeah well, it's one, it's one thing that we've you know one of the things about being a classical guitarist is it really is who's kind of the last man standing and in, yeah. uh, in our in our field, you know, because it is a it is a difficult field to break into. It's very difficult uh, to to transition from school into the professional circuit as TJ, I'm, I'm sure you're well aware. And then, yeah. you know, it's, it's, it's a constant battle, but uh, Steve and I, uh, we definitely saw eye to eye, both in a lot of the repertoire that we were choosing. We noticed in our solo programs, we were playing a lot of the same stuff. So we're like, mm -hmm. why don't we try this and instant chemistry. And it just kind of picked up from there. So. Yeah. That's awesome. 
So do you guys ever have any interpretive differences since you seem like you have a lot of things in common, you always seem to match up well? Do you ever have any interpretive differences? And if so, how do you typically resolve them? Great question. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, I think, uh, again, because we um, sort of initially started working due to similar tastes, um, a lot of times we're definitely like just naturally on the same page, which I think makes the job easier. Uh, certainly there are times when we will have um, opposing things, but I think, I don't know, I think we're pretty democratic as a duo, you know, we, we hear and respect the other person. I, myself as an interpreter, like I was just saying to you before about Invocation y Danza, um, I always, I, I don't ever view there being one right way of playing a piece, you know, so I'll always yeah. entertain different ones. Um, and, and I think, you know, um, it's probably half and half of the times when maybe I'll heed to Adam's maybe idea about something and he'll heed to mine, you know, and in the end, I think we're, we're both usually satisfied with the result regardless. So I think it's a matter of like dropping the ego, trusting the other person and just being mm -hmm. open to the idea that I think music should have different interpretations between people over time. You know, we, we play pieces now very differently than we did a few years ago for the ones that are keeping around. So mm -hmm. I think just that, that philosophy of viewing it as a, a living, breathing thing rather than a, a perfectly planned artifact that you have to recreate every single time the same way, you know, yeah. I don't really, I don't really view music that way. I don't think Adam does either. So that's it. pretty, that's really... pretty easy to, pretty easy to resolve. Usually very, very well put. Uh, if I could just, add one little thing to that. I don't think Steve and I really ever have major interpretive uh, differences. Not I think major, when we do yeah. have differences, it's mostly technical. It's mostly like how to execute things. Mm -hmm. um, and we're really good at, you know, kind of filling in each other's uh, gaps and working with the complementary strengths and all these things. Um, and like, like Steve says, uh, I'm never... 100% uh, convinced on an interpretation is kind of a living, breathing thing. It's a fluid concept. It needs to constantly uh, be challenged. And sometimes when you're in performance, things will just happen that you'll work with and then it'll end up becoming part of your interpretation later too. So um, yeah, it's, it, it, you know, it's, it's, it's a, it's a complicated answer, but at the end of the day, it's really, uh, really nice to work with somebody who I see eye to eye with on basically everything. Yeah, for sure. When you talk about incorporating your guys' different strengths and weaknesses. Do you ever swap different passages within your parts with each other for something that fits one of you guys' playing styles better? We've sure. definitely done that before. Yeah, yeah. Adam is, uh, yeah, there are certain like scale type passages and also playing in, in like the high register I can think of that Adam, Adam uh, excels at, you know, so, mm -hmm. and he likes it. He likes playing high up on the neck, so I'll, I'll <laughs> gladly let him do it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and yeah, there, there are other things too where, um, you know, um, yeah, sometimes we just pass, we, we will even have a repetition of a section and we'll, mm -hmm. uh, we'll pass something back and forth for the sake of like a variety on the repeat. Yeah, exactly. And, and usually, and usually that A, B comparison, even though they both sound good, you'll hear the differences and you think like, oh, what are, what are you doing there that, that makes this groove or makes this melody sound a little bit better? So, mm -hmm. um, again, I think both of our sort of strengths will sort of, uh, inform the other person when, when mm -hmm. we when we do that. And we do that a lot in the arrangements that we play as well. So, yeah, yeah. I, I personally just really like picking Steve's brain for, for, uh, for fingerings. Um, whenever I have, uh, you know, I usually find it's a left-hand thing. Like Steve's definitely in, in the past and like maybe when we first started working as a duo was, was, uh, had a much more developed right hand sound. Like mm -hmm. it was a much thicker tone. And so I learned a lot from him back then, you know, and that was one of the things that, uh, that he, you know, he really brought to my playing. Uh, but now it's, we're really at the point where we get really into the nitpicky details about fingering. So uh, I really like when I get stuck on a, on a problem and I'm pretty good at problem solving, but I, I obviously I have still a lot to learn and it's nice to, you know, bounce those ideas off Steve. And uh, he always has a pretty elegant solution. And what we end up, uh, creating these things we call super fingerings, which are basically <laughs> when two brains become one and we have uh, these, these, these awesome fingerings that uh, we're nice. very proud of. Yeah, <laughs> it's having a lot. Super, super fingering, we coined super it. Super fingering. <laughs> so how much time would you guys say, like proportionally, do you guys spend working solo on your individual parts versus together on the like overall rehearsal or bouncing ideas back and forth? I mean, well, uh, the bouncing ideas back and forth, uh, it's these days because of logistics. I mean... Mm -hmm. um, 
uh, you know, we, we were never in the same city. That's the thing. You know, it was always Montreal, Ottawa. And now it being even further away, um, you know, I think we're a very high percentage doing this separately. Um, but we're constantly sending messages and little videos to each other um, about, do you do this here? How does this work? Um, and we also, yeah, we talk about the interpretations. And I think because we've been playing together long enough, uh, we can afford to do this. I think if we were a younger duo, we wouldn't be able to get away with actually living this this far away. But mm -hmm. um, because of what we built over the past few years, I'm confident that if we can get together for a few days, um, we'll both have done our homework, respective homework, and yeah. it'll, it'll, it'll come together quite fast. You know, we've done that enough times now to, to trust each other, I think. Yeah. Yeah. The, the, that point is key. And, and because I remember, um, when solo duo came to Ala Grande, they were talking a little bit about this and, you know, when you're a young duo uh, or a young ensemble, it's really, really important to get, put the, the, the rehearsal hours in, um, as an ensemble, as a unit, in addition to the solo hours that you've put into uh, building up your, your chops um, mm -hmm. and learning the parts. And, uh, you know, solo duo, again, is a great example of two guitarists that live in relatively far away from each other, but, you know, they're still playing together all the time. And, uh, you know, we, Steve and I, uh, because we were doing our doctorates at McGill every week, so even though uh, we were doing our doctorates at McGill at the same time and I was coming into Montreal every week, sorry, um, it was easier for us at the beginning to have that time where we could just get together and rehearse and through years of doing that and then recording albums together and then performing you know dozens and dozens of, of concerts per year um, it adds up to the point where we can get together only a couple of times in a year but we have these really intense very hard working sessions like for example last month in february um actually it's two months ago now uh, steve and i got together in in chelsea which is uh, near ottawa and we just sat in a barn for a week and we just went over all these new fingerings for the new album that we're going to be recording this year and uh we had spent three months leading up to that working on our arrangements engraving scores putting in our own fingerings and then coming together and then working on our super fingerings so it was like a <laughs> it was a process you know yeah uh, i'm sorry to bring the super fingerings thing up again but uh, at the end of the day it's it's uh you know that's the way we work now and it works for yeah. us but it's it's it, the, the message is, you know, if you're a young duo and you're just starting, you really got to put the reps in. So it's uh, it, it works for us, but don't don't try it at home, basically. <laughs> <laughs> in between your guys' in-person meetings, do you use any digital aids to supplement not rehearsing, like playing along with a MIDI or recordings or things like that? Oh, definitely, and... yeah. I do a lot of playing along with recording, playing along with our own recordings, playing along with... Um, recordings of, of pianists because we do a lot of uh, piano rep these days yeah um, and I try not to uh, stick to any one single recording I try to play with multiple different types of recordings because everybody's sense of rubato is going to be a little bit different so trying to get and feel different senses of rubato but mm -hmm. um, in general I like to learn my part without listening to anything first so that I kind of make up my mind about what I think interpretively before starting to um, get input from other musicians you know because otherwise you would kind of box yourself in I'd say I don't know. What about you, Steve? Yeah, yeah, I do the same. I mean, I play along with uh, recordings if they exist sometimes. Uh, I Not for every piece, because this would be too much effort, but certainly for pieces where um, our parts are similar, sometimes I'll actually go through the effort of recording both parts or looping both parts. Mm -hmm. um, again, just to, just to hear it, you know what I mean? And just to, uh, yeah, work it as if there's a second person there. I just, I pretend to be Adam as well. I, I find... <laughs> I find that's actually really useful when you're arranging too, because I remember when I was working on a lot of these new Ravel scores, for example, they're pretty dense textures and uh, trying to figure out how I was going to voice things. You know, you put it up and you engrave, uh, you put it up on, on, on Finale and you, you think it's going to work just great. But then when you start fingering through, through things, you notice that, uh, you know, the melody isn't able to sing because you've got too many things going on underneath. Mm -hmm. So you try to redistribute as you go. And rather than uh, send all those problems to Steve and he has to figure it out, if I'm doing the arrangement or if he's doing the arrangement, we vice we can work on it vice versa mm -hmm. and, and, and fix it into our, in our own parts before getting together. So we save that kind of step, you know? Nice. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then one last question regarding some of the duo stuff. You guys are both working in so many different ensembles at the same time, plus you're doing all your solo repertoire and the recording projects, how do you manage your time to get all of this stuff in shape and, and ready for, uh, for crunch time? <laughs> do you want to, you want to go first? I'll, I'll no, I think you should go first. And the reason I say that is because Steve, like I, I'm really good at time management. I don't know how Steve in the last three weeks is still alive based on 
what you're just saying. Uh, you know, he has had the craziest last three weeks. Plus, he was dealing with a, a cold. So, Steve, how did, how did you manage to do it? Well, again, like this is, I can tell you what has happened. And uh, again, I wouldn't recommend it. Uh, you know, learn from, learn from my mistakes. Um, like, uh, and then this happened two years ago as well. Like, it's just um, many programs uh, have just lined up at the same time. And I, I did have free time like five months ago. It wasn't like I started last minute. Um, but uh, in order to, to get the job done this month, I basically had to pull like, you know, 12 hour days, most days, weekends and stuff included. I had to make some sacrifices for my health and other things. Um, and it's not, yeah, it's, it's not the, it's not the, the best way to go. So, um, again, I've learned from this that I, cause I do have some control over planning. I'm, you know, I now know that this is too much for, for any given time. Um, and you know, I do think, um, I, I could maybe, uh, I don't know. It's, it's, it's hard. It's hard to explain. This is, this is a big question of actually dealing with myself right now. Um, you know, I, I actually talk about um, Adam seems to be very good at, again, time management and like um, scheduling his day and, and actually doing many different things. You know, it's like I'll do two hours of practice. I have an hour of admin. I'm going to do a 30 minutes of Duolingo Spanish, go for a walk and then practice again. And it's 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 inspiring. But um, I, I, I tend to really work in big blocks. At least I think I have, I have myself locked into this self, self understanding that today's your practice day or today's an admin day. Uh -huh. um, and it's just teaching and other things have gotten ahead of me in the past few months that those practice days just never really happened. Uh, unfortunately, I was again, so I think if I had ha maybe was able to distribute things and have at least an hour every day of practicing, you know, and just be really organized about it. Um, but I would just be preoccupied with again, the other things in a music life. Um, in bigger chunks, and then the practicing would take a back seat, and then I have to I have to catch up later. Again, I'm I'm mm -hmm. confident in myself I can do it, um, and I did do it this past month, but it was not pleasant. So yeah, you know, yeah planning that, that, pl planning is one planning is one thing, and also again, this time management is something I'm I'm still learning to be honest. But, <laughs> but you know what's what, what's interesting when you're talking to me is because you're you're saying it like you're not succeeding, but what's 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 weird about the whole thing is that you make it work for yourself. So when I say time management, it's it's the way I see time management, your sense of time management is completely different and you can make it work. But yeah, the problem is that it, when you're sick and you're on, you have to learn all these different programs because a lot of the, like the, the solo rep that you were doing, especially last week, was all brand new stuff, you know, and you, yeah. you're meeting composers to run these pieces by them and you're dealing with that. Like, I, I just know that I wouldn't be able to, 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 to do it with the way that you do. But, you know, one person's answer could be completely different for someone else. And I think... Yeah. Uh, for for me, time management is a it, it's it's a thing where you're kind of planning. You always have short and long term goals um, set way ahead of time, and so I you know when I have multiple programs going, I know that you know for this type of program I'm gonna need you know uh, three and a half months. It's minimum three and a half months for this type of program. But for for the the dual program that Steve and I are working, I need like six months. Uh, for the solo program I'm working, it's eighteen months. It's you know, solo programs obviously take, take a lot more work because you're there's nowhere to hide. It's all everything's very very exposed, right? So you have to have all these kind of timelines going on simultaneously in your head, you know, and uh, mm -hmm. mix and match with your teaching schedule and with uh, your admin time. And so you definitely, for me at least, uh, need to set aside some time every day and tackle a little bit of it. Um, mm -hmm. And that's the way I work. And I have like the you know, prescribed times in the day where I do those things. So like Steve says, you know, I wake up in the morning, I'll, I'll have breakfast, I'll do an hour to an hour and a half of practice right away. I'll do 30 to minutes to an hour of, of admin, then I'll have lunch, then I'll go back to practice, I'll do some more admin, I'll do some some uh, language learning. I'm not doing Spanish right now, by the way, I'm working on Mandarin, it's been, it's been about a month, and oh, then nice. go back to, to guitar. Uh, so, you know, and obviously that'll change from day to day. But the, the, the the point is, is that it's easier for me to, to, to handle it that way because I feel like um, doing a 12 hour day or doing things in really, really big chunks, it just would completely burn me out. And yeah, uh, it, it did. Know, I it's think it would burn most people out too. <laughs> I think Steve's, Steve's a special, a special case, you know. Well, no, it burned, it burned me out again. I'm alive, but, uh, but you know, I was not, I was not, I was not in the best shape. Yeah. Yeah. It's tough. Music, music's tough. What, what do you do, TJ? I'm curious. <laughs> what do I do? Um... I'm I'm a bit uh, I'm a bit like Steve, except um, I just do big chunks every single day. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
Yeah, I'm not I'm not great on time management, so I just like I just like a lot like seven hours a day for like music stuff, and then fit everything wow. else around that. Wow. Yeah. And you make yeah. it work. Yeah, more or and less. Plus, you by, have like you, not are sleeping. You still <laughs> how, how often are you streaming right now? Uh, I stream every day. I, I stream my practice sessions, so I, I more or less make that like two for one. That's crazy. <laughs> Good for you. Yeah. Well, back to you guys, though. So can you tell us about the uh, the program that you're running for this series of concerts in BC and what thoughts went into deciding the pieces that you wanted for your rep? Beautiful. Go for it, Steve. Um, so, I mean, what we've been doing for the past few years is um, just sort of uh, highlights from our two, two existing albums right now, um, which the first one was New Canadian Music and the second one was mostly... Um, arrangements of uh, 20th century French music. Mm -hmm. um, so, um, yeah, we have having done that for a few years and um, uh, just sort of wanting to ex expand on those ideas without going too far away because we really liked what we were getting in terms mm -hmm. of, uh, in terms of just, I think, artistic satisfaction and audience response. Like the last album was, was quite, I mean, for my, by my standards, like a lot of streams, pretty successful, and like we had we had a lot of concerts, so uh, you know that was obviously very motivating because we loved the music as well. Mm -hmm. um, so we sort of um, this next album uh, called Lyric, um, which uh, we're sort of putting forth uh, some of the new material from it on this tour, um, involves some more arrangements of the same composers from the last album, such as Ravel, Mampou, and Germain Taifer. Mm -hmm. um, and then uh, again, we just wanted to take this idea, which we love, of this piano music from this and just expand it a little bit further in both directions. So we went back a little bit further and a little bit different in character and are arranging a bunch of, um, or have arranged several of uh, Edvard Grieg's lyric pieces. So we have a large set of those that we'll be mm -hmm. playing. And uh, again, very, we sort of can hear these pieces that I think that would work on guitar. And I, we were absolutely, it really feels like guitar music. There's very little yeah. changes. It's very, it's not too, not too busy um, and just really works. So very happy yeah, so, with so that. Some of the pieces could honestly be solo guitar pieces. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So splitting it up for duo is, has, has again made it um, given much more liberty in the interpretive side of things. Uh, and then we also have, you know, to go the other side, we also have this sort of um, early John Cage piece, which is much, which is more of a minimalist uh, sort of modal language, um, as opposed to his later more experimental stuff. Um, so again, piano music, um, but expand like that we did on our last album, but expanding the time frame and the style a little bit. Um, and so, yeah, this program that we're touring will have again, some stuff from our early albums, but it's about 50% totally new for us that we have not played in concert yet. So pretty excited to, uh, bring, yeah, bring a new program for the first time in a few years. Yeah. I'm looking forward to hearing it. There's some really, really cool things on that program. And most of it was stuff that you guys have arranged. Um, could you maybe talk about your arranging process? What are maybe some of the important things to keep in mind when making a good guitar arrangement? Some things that uh, you might want to avoid or pay attention to? Yeah, well, uh, playability is obviously like the, the number one thing. Um, you know, without, without becoming too generalized in my answer to that, um, you know, we... The arranging process for us is really about choosing the repertoire, the right repertoire from mm -hmm. the get-go. Um, because we, once you start doing lots of arrangements, you start to hear in music what would work really well. Um, so obviously, because the guitar doesn't have the same range as the piano, and Steve and I typically arrange mostly piano music. We've done other music for other instruments, but piano music, about over 90% of the stuff that we do arranging of. Um, you have to choose a specific type of piano repertoire. So you can't choose stuff um, with a much larger range than the guitar. Uh, mm -hmm. We're both playing on six string instruments, so we don't have the really low notes. Um, and again, if you have lots of high stuff, yeah, we can do artificial harmonics and all that stuff, but it, you know, it limits uh, things like speed um, and stuff. So we, we generally stick to lyrical um, piano repertoire and that's what this whole new album is is about it's about this this uh, piano re relatively simple piano music I would say mm -hmm. um, there's definitely some virtuosic stuff in it and there's there is one original guitar piece on the album as well but uh, mostly uh, from the point of view of arranging what we try to do is pick you know a piece that we're able to give one melody to one guitar the, the, the main melody to one guitar and the textural harmonic bass line everything else to the other guitar obviously that's mm -hmm. a huge generalization um and there are 
rules that we break in that process. But um, once we're there, then it's easy to pass those types of those motives back and forth between the guitars, yeah. right? Especially when you have repeats and um, this, this new Grieg that we're doing. It, it's a lot of ABA. It's a lot of um, repet like structures that are repeated. So um, we'll give one guitar the, the lead and then the sec second guitar will be on the harmony and then we'll uh, flip that over. So you get a little bit of a different timbre on the repeat and a little bit mm -hmm. of a different maybe uh, interpretation. Um, naturally, without the the single guitar player having to figure all that out by themselves, yeah, um, like you would if you were a soloist, for example. Um, and then, of course, you know, once you start uh, getting into it, um, figuring out how to keep the essence of the music is really, really important. So, um, not uh, you know, if you are going to delete notes, because when you do piano repertoire, you're going to have to. It's it's just it's just the way it works. We only have six strings, right, or twelve mm -hmm. strings with the two guitars. Um, it's choosing which notes you can delete, uh, which you know octave uh, repeats you can you can get get rid of. Uh, how you're going to change register of one line um, so that it works with the guitar. Um, all these types of decisions you just kind of get get good at them over time, and mm -hmm. uh, you know you learn the ins and outs of the notation process and how to engrave and and uh, working with. Uh, Les Productions does, who does uh, publishing for our works, has really helped us kind of refine our process uh, in in the score notation because obviously that's uh, really important as well. Uh, anything mm -hmm. to add to that, Steve? No, oh, I think I think you covered everything I would have said. Yeah. Awesome. When you're doing things to make the piece more playable for guitar, how far would you allow yourself to stray from the source material in in pursuit of that? Like, what's like the what's the stretch limit for what you can remove? Would you say? I feel like I've been talking a lot, so I'll let. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> sure, I mean, sure, yeah. That's, um, I mean, that that is the question. Uh, so the the toughest thing I think is when you get to, um, like, I guess, complicated harmonies and voicings, and and um, you know which ones, if you have to omit notes, which ones really need to be there for the color of the harmony or for some sort of uh, melodic function. So. Um, you know, uh, I don't know how, how far can we go? Um, I mean, in general, the stuff that we do, the arrangements w w and transcriptions that we do are pretty close to the source material. Uh, we don't, again, it's a question of what repertoire you're choosing. You know, I know that like, for example, Roland Dienz, um, when he does arrangements or when he did arrangements, um, he would often stretch very far away from the source material, um, within his own kind of style. Mm -hmm. And he had a very original kind of uh, voice, you know, a lot of a lot of interesting decisions that were made. But at the end of the day, he was always keeping the essence of the piece there. Um, mm -hmm. For the two of us, we're more into kind of we're a little bit more purist with our approach. So if we are going to arrange something from piano, we want to pretty much keep everything the same rhythms notes yeah, I, uh, I pitch think... classes and registers and all those things as much as we can. Obviously, you're going to have to make decisions. Um, having two guitars really makes that a lot easier than having to do it on one. Um, but I think mostly, say... well, just I think in the, in the case, again, because I think we chose pieces that didn't require too much string away. I think the most extreme things we're doing is like omitting occasional octaves on like a melody. Because mm -hmm. again, that's a very p idiomatic pianistic thing. And in the high register on the guitar, it's just it doesn't make sense. So you just yeah. will omit that octave. Um, and also, again, re just register things like that is the biggest thing. Like often on the piano, there will be something where um, the the bass part is two octaves away from the melody, and that just will not really work. Maybe depending on where it is, so we'll have it. You know, still there's still a supporting spot on the bottom and a, and a main melody on top. But we'll just test it out. Like, does this still come through clearly if we play it on the guitars with only one octave distance? Mm -hmm. um, and if it doesn't, we either have to adjust our touch, the playing, or maybe rethink the arrangement. But those are the biggest changes we're doing. I don't think we omit that many notes or or stray. We we even choose pieces that are usually in guitar friendly keys because I mm -hmm. love. I don't know. I come to love pieces. Um, to my ear comes to really think that like, you know, Ravel's Pavan has to be in G major, for example, to me. Like I can't, when I hear it in another key, no matter how beautiful the arrangement is, I'm just like, there's something about G major. Yeah, yeah. So usually, usually again, it, it, obviously with some exceptions, um, yeah. but I like, I like that we're able to keep most of them in their original tonalities. And that comes down again to the choice that you make at the beginning. And also yeah. the fact that we have two guitars, because if you think about the Typhair that we did on our first album, obviously A flat, 
not a key that we play in too often as guitarists. We, we do, but it's re- kind of refreshing to hear a piece in A-flat. I think that was one of the reasons why people really loved it so much is because they're mm-hmm. hearing this, you know, it's easy for if, if you have one guitar that's able to bar and play all the harmonies below while the other one's doing the high register yeah. stuff, you know? Yeah. Uh, you mm-hmm. can't really do A-flat with those and keep the notes the same if you're trying to do it as a solo arrangement. So um, mm-hmm. that, that really, really, really helps. Uh, there's definitely mm-hmm. been some, like, gestures, though, like instrumental gestures from other instruments that we've had to translate. Um, I think of like in the second movement of the Taifa from our first yeah. album, harp sweep, um, the yeah. large, the large harp sweep where they, you know, do a, a chromatic uh, line and a large scale that is just a huge, massive gesture with multi, with huge resonance that guitar just literally cannot do. Yeah. Right. So we ended up just taking that as two separate glissandi and a resolution on a harmonic at the top. You know, it's not quite as, as big and as, as, it's not what Typhar necessarily intended, but you know the rest of the work works super super well. So we made a little bit of a compromise at that yeah. one, you know. And then, like Steve says, you know, sometimes you'll have gestures on a piano which sweep across the whole instrument uh, really really fast, and guitar just doesn't necessarily do that so well. So um, you have to kind of be clever with how you um, reorient things. Um, and you know, when in like for example, in the third movement of the Sonnets in by uh, by Maurice Ravel. Um, I have these sextuplet gestures, which resolve into Steve playing a high harmonic, which is mm-hmm. just on the piano, just right. But it doesn't it doesn't work the notes as written because it's just way way too complicated, and it would yeah. take the entire guitar to get up to. So Steve had this great idea where he's like, "Well, why don't you just play these as PIM arpeggios with open strings, and just choose you know uh, notes that are within your arpeggios, and just change the registers, and then I was able to keep up the sextuplets without sacrificing speed." As a result, so you know, you're, it, it really is about uh, knowing the instrument super well, and then you know, recognizing when something's not going to work, and knowing how to make the compromise to make it work. Mm-hmm. Great, great, good examples that you pulled out just now. <laughs> no, I arranged them. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I guess some more personal questions for you guys now. Um, so I guess for each of you, what got you into guitar in the first place and what about it keeps you motivated and attached so that you uh, keep coming back to it? Like you said, like it's kind of like a marathon. Whoever stays in the longest wins. What what, what keeps you in it? Oh, man. Uh, well, I, I'm just crazy about music. I'm always listening to music. I'm always absorbing it. Um, it's, it's like this massive puzzle, this massive, beautiful maze sound it just releases dopamine um every time i hear it and i just i just can't have enough of it so that i you know the fact that i continue to play guitar every day just kind of reinforces that that loop that i'm in you know it's just an obsession i think people that want to do music and want to get into music kind of need that to a certain extent maybe not as much as i i have it but like uh to make it work in music, you need to be completely obsessed about it because yeah, uh, sure. it's, a, it's a difficult life to, to pursue for sure. Mm-hmm. But how did you get into it, Adam? I got into it because my mom played guitar and she was a she was a singer singer and she you know play in the company herself and she taught herself uh, how to play some chords and she showed me her, my base the basic chords on the guitar and I really loved it and I was always watching her play in a band and uh, just really really loved that. I always kind of wanted to to have that for myself so. Yeah, nice. Um, so for me, um, well, I started out as a, as a as a drummer. That was well, I did play a bit of piano, but my main sort of musical training when I was young, younger was was drumming, um, which I'm doing again these days too, which is very fun. But I do very distinctly remember when I started playing drums and getting into very different style of music, rock music. Um, I was just really envious of the the tone, the sounds that were coming out of people who played the electric guitar specifically. It was the electric guitar and like, I just remember when I was like 15 hearing like really nice tube amp, really nice delay pedal and just, oh, again, these that textures like gla- and, and- Glassy tone. Yeah, and like and like harmonies, harmonies. I got really envious. I, I think I always, I don't know, I tried to, um, trying to like, again, understand myself a lot uh, and my, my taste that I've developed. But I think because yeah. of my drumming background, I always said like, okay, rhythm is the musical element that I'm like mm-hmm. most, most driven by. But um, when I think to that moment, and, and again, the reason I go back to picking up the guitar every day, um, it's that it's not really rhythm and it's not really melody. It's like harmony. Like I just, I pick up the guitar and again, when I have like, when my strings are new and my nails are good and I just play some like 
A minor seven chord or something like that. That just gives still again. It's like what Adam was talking about. That dopamine just starts to yeah. come. And like I get it when I play grooves. I get it when I play a beautiful melody. Um, but the guitar specifically, and my taste. I guess my my um, like what I've described as the original sort of candy for my ears as like this electric guitar timbre, which I still love. That has now become the nylon string classical sound. Mm -hmm. It's just the, the the sound itself is just so. Yeah, it's like satisfying a hunger that my ears have <laughs> in yeah. a yeah. weird way. Yeah. Harmony, har harmony, and sound. Again, I love. Uh, there's so many other aspects of music, and I could also agree with everything Adam said. But um, just yeah, just seeing what I do instinctively when I pick up the guitar. Some people pick up the guitar and they start ripping scales first thing. I'm just like, that is the last thing I want to do. I'll mm -hmm. do it if I have to, but it's the last thing <laughs> yeah. I want to. It's the last thing I want to do when I pick up a guitar. I just want to hear some chords <laughs> yeah chords, i don't i don't know that's that's just that's sort of whatever again my self-analysis in this mm -hmm. context of this interview today yeah i mean yeah. that's why we arrange so much ravel is just that the way that yeah. he saw harmony was so unique you know mm -hmm. and it's just like every time you hear one of the chords it's you just like you listen to it and you know it's right you don't yeah. you know it's it's you wouldn't maybe you would never have found it, but he did, and then he he put it next to another perfect chord, and then he put another <laughs> perfect chord after it, and then it was just all these perfect chords, and it just creates creates this this beautiful this, this world, yeah, this, this world yes. that you could just yeah, yeah. dive into, you know, yeah, yeah. So yeah, harmony. So it's sad answer. that he didn't write for guitar. That's why we do our arrangements, you know. Yeah. <laughs> Have you felt that uh, guitar or music, uh, whether it's practicing or performing, has made an impact in other areas, maybe non-musical areas of your life? Has it translated to other aspects? La language learning, for example. Uh, music, well, I mean, I'm, this is still relatively fresh that I've been starting to learn Mandarin, but mm -hmm. um, for those who don't know, Mandarin is a, is a tonal language and there are f uh, five tones. Um, and some tones go up, some tones go down, some go up, down, then up, some stay uh, high, a little higher, some are more neut neutral. Um, and having developed musician ears makes it a lot easier for me to hear that in speech. Mm -hmm. um, and I mean, all languages have, have a beauty to them and, and everything. But, but something about picking up Mandarin has been really, really fun because... My musician background and I and I could understand why people who learn Mandarin as their first language uh, why there's so much uh, there's such a prevalence of perfect pitch in in Asian cultures mm -hmm. because um, they, they they've already had tones like embedded in their DNA yeah. from a very early age so anyway yeah. so that, that's one thing that I that just immediately jumped to my to mind when you when you brought up that question I don't yeah. know about Steve if he has anything to add yeah, I can't think of uh, like uh, too many specific examples, but there are many times when I, I, I guess I realize I'm like, I'm, a, I'm approaching this, I'm approaching this task I have like a performer or the same way I do learning a piece. Like if I have to, if I have like some sort of writing engagement or from preparing for a presentation, you know, mm -hmm. again, like this, da this daily chipping away at it, the sort of the practice run throughs, the, the first, the first draft, the self, the self critique, the further refining. I'm just like, uh, again, it might have nothing to do with music, but I realize, oh, I'm just approaching this the same way I learned that piece last month you know um so again it's it's just this this sort of daily sort of slow i think you know maybe to the outsiders they think you know you need so much like patience to to work on classical music because it takes so long sometimes mm -hmm. to get something under your fingers but um yeah i've just i think that skill set that sort of work pace and flow uh yeah. finds its way into other like i said tasks and it's helped me i think overcome them because I've gotten pretty good at learning pieces, you know, mm -hmm, yeah. so, so that's just something I, again, I can't think of too many of the examples other than a no, presentation that's, or some that's writing, perfect. but, but yeah, that's, yeah, that's, yeah, that's, that, I, I completely agree with that. Yeah, absolutely. So it's like the, the, the generalization of how to practice, how to work on things and the kinds of patience required for learning a new skill set is the thing that really transfers over. That's it, you know, just like, again, problem solving, again, mm -hmm. keeping organized, keeping self tabs and like, the, again, the, the daily, the daily regimen rather than cramming, you know. Yeah. Um, again, I'm sort of counteracting what I said earlier when I was like confessing about <laughs> my, uh, my, my inability to do this and then how I paid for it. But, you know, I have good days and bad days. <laughs> yeah. All right. So are there anything that you guys do to keep yourself healthy because the guitar position is pretty terrible for you and especially when you're spending long hours on it <laughs> do you do anything off the guitar that helps you like keep yourself from falling apart 
Uh, I do. I had to. I had to go through an injury to learn the. You know that it's important to. Uh, obviously, the warm up is really really important. How how you start your day on the guitar, uh, but also the types of stretches that I do before I play. Um, active stretching. So I do stretches, but movement at the same time, mm-hmm. right? So I don't just do the these stretches. Yeah. The, these are the good good stretches. These static stretches are good at the end of a long day because they they fatigue. The muscle, at least that's what uh, several physiotherapists have told me in the past. Okay. But active stretching, as in, you know, you're, you're, you're moving as you do the stretch, mm-hmm. is good for when you start your day. So I do a lot of that. Um, but also, I mean, I can't overemphasize that just don't, don't do too, too much time, at, do, like too much of a chunk of time of, in, in a practice, a session. Give yourself lots of break uh, time and make sure that you drink lots of water, obviously, and do other things with your day. Um, so if you want to practice, you know, eight hours in a day, well, you you need 14 hours, you know? So that's why I, I typically just don't practice eight hours in a day. I, I like to go somewhere between, uh, you know, three to five hours. So I'll, mm-hmm. I'll make sure that I have eight hours of my day, um, yeah. to be able to practice, you know, four, four and a half. Yeah. I mean, I, I do some, I do some, uh, basic core exercises and, and stretching. And I think luckily just the, the lifestyle I, I lead here just has me walking or biking quite frequently. So that mm-hmm. keeps me from living too sedentary of a lifestyle. Um, but yeah, I think, I, I mean, I, I don't really pull that many really long days practicing, I don't think. And, and when I do, um, uh, again, I, I think, I remember reading that John Williams didn't like would never play for more than 25 minutes in a sitting without without at least getting up for like a five mm-hmm. minute or 10 minute walk around or break. Um, and yeah, I mean, I just find myself again, mentally and physically, if I do something similar, but make sure I go back, I don't get distracted, you know, yeah. uh, but these li- little little breaks are, are, are key, I think, you know, but again, I've, I've also on top of this, I think, at least when I'm at home, I, I do have still have some tension, but um, I've, I've thought very hard over the years about my, my positioning and, and, and how to, I guess, you know, be as ergonomic as possible when I'm playing. Mm-hmm. Again, I'm not, it's not perfect, but I think having really worked on that in the past has allowed me to maybe uh, avoid potential injury at, at, my old, at my old age. <laughs> yeah. And you worked a lot with Lysen, didn't you? And he's all about that. Uh... Exactly. Well, it's yeah. all, it's all, it's basically all, all his methods that are, that are constantly coming back. I mean, there's, there's things about that. I'm reminding myself every day because it's guitar is tough. And again, every little chair might be different or the guitar lift might be on like a centimeter higher. So I'll find mm-hmm. myself, but, but there's things like, like little reminders that again, every day of like how, where to sit on um, my, my sitting bones. I have a point in my lower back where I always lift up and say, like, okay, let that go. Sort of op- open the chest, relax the, the chest. jaw, sort of lean back a little bit because we always have a tendency to do this. So there's like, again, there's these little reset things that I'll do in my, in my warm up, And usually I find if I'm practicing and uh, things are not feeling or sounding quite good, I realize that I've sort of gone outside of that. I've sort of yeah. enclosed again a little bit. So mm-hmm. sort of, uh, again, uh, so that again, that's something that is just a big part of my self awareness and practicing. So that is again mm-hmm. like help help me avoid some of these common problems because it's so tough to. I know it's easier said than done. I worked I worked very hard and I still struggle with it. But it's such a difficult instrument. It's and tension again. It always I see it in my students all the time. It just it always comes from uh, like great musical instincts or usually does. You know, it's the, the, the they're, they're tense because they want to do something there. But mm-hmm. uh, so it's so hard to 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 get the, rid of the tension and keep the musical sort of goal uh yeah. you know attainable um you know it's a hard thing to to work on so anyhow that's the I challenge just, for all. Um, <laughs> i was gonna ask you actually steven you, you started bringing up your students how often in a, you know in your lessons with your students are you addressing postural coordination Pre- yeah pretty 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 posture? pretty frequently again there are um Again, depending on the, sometimes there's just too many deadlines coming up in terms of rep that we just got to get to the music. Uh, and in that case, it would just be a little reminder. Yeah, exactly. I know. It'll just be like, okay, this is, you know, a little reminder here and there, you know, do this, sit like this, adjust this, this sitting position is not quite working. Uh, so, you know, little things here and there, but in order for those little reminders to actually mean anything, um, ideally what I try to do is again, have like at least a couple of lessons or something where, and this is what Leisner did with me, you know, it's like, put your rep away. It's like, or bring me some like Carcassi study and go, we're going to go back to basics and we're going to do this for, for two lessons. And you're going to only do 
through this for a few weeks and there was no progress on graduate level repertoire you know um, so I'm, I'm trying to in my own practice as a teacher um, especially in students that I see that who need it who have a lot of mm -hmm. tension well, everybody um, needs it but some need everybody it needs it but some need it more than others yeah some you can really tell it's holding them back more Correct. and you know so I'm trying to again time management as a teacher be like okay we got this rep let's get ahead of it because these two weeks we're working on your body, you know, that's, yeah. it's just, that's, that's, it's, it's gotta be like, a, it's a non-negotiable mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. yeah. for, uh, for, for professional guitarists. It's, yeah. uh, yeah. So too many, I mean, not only just to unlock your full musical potential, which I think is, is there, but I've known way too many people who have, who have gotten injured to the point where they can't play anymore. And it's, 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 uh, it's, it's a, it's a problem. Yeah, you know? for sure. Everybody needs to be more, aware mm -hmm. and sharing sharing ideas about it so I, yeah, I like, I'm, big, I like I'm a big proponent of Leisner yeah yeah and I like your thought what you mentioned and I do this as well um, in every warm-up I have mm -hmm. something that I dedicate specifically to uh, ten tension and relaxation um, mm -hmm. and I just saw this really great uh, video I think it was an Instagram of uh, from the guitar lab Bok Young Byun talking about uh, I don't know if you guys saw this but um, no when she works on with her students, you know, she typically sees a lot of tension coming from left hand. Uh, you know, obviously the right hand is relatively static in guitar. I mean, it's moving around, but it's, it's pretty much in one space, but the left hand has got a lot of ground to cover. Mm -hmm. And especially when we're playing larger, more complex music um, with lots of shifts and lots of bars and, and lots of large chords, um, that's where the tension is usually manifests you know think of you know some works by uh, Castanovo Tedesco or something yeah. you know where it was a pianist that writing for the guitar so you know some things were not necessarily ideal um, and what Bok Young was saying uh, is that every time she has a shift she literally has like a mental checkpoint to practice a shift and relax mm -hmm. immediately after and it's and for everything for yeah. everything that she does in her warm-up and in her practice so and she is trying very hard to impart that on her students because that's where we get tense is when we're moving mm -hmm. obviously mm -hmm. right because we got to we got to move with the left hand so um having these this, this like kind of constant in inhibition ab ability to inhibit a movement and tell us ourselves to relax as they do in alexander technique um i think is a really powerful tool for a guitarist because we do a lot of artificial um difficult movements and i think uh i was reading some research that the guitar is among the most difficult biomechanical instruments to master because of that the, the long awkward stretches that we have to do with the left hand so uh, i think it's really it's really important to ha kind of get into that habit where we stop relax move on to the next movement and get into the habit of doing that and eventually it will become second nature so you don't have to think about it anymore yeah, it just naturally happens but it's the learning how to do that at the beginning which is very difficult because most of us come to the guitar a little bit later in life. Um, mm -hmm. I'm not saying that we don't all start at young ages, but where we start to become aware of our bodies and how our bodies function in space and what our bodies look like in space, um, that tends to happen a little bit later. And at that point, lots of bad habits have kind of manifested into our playing. So we have to take a step back and recognize what it is. Um, and I find one thing that really works for me is taking videos of myself and watching myself, especially I carry a lot of tension in my face so I've been working a lot of, uh, for a long time on re just relaxing my face when I play. And I still see it in my videos all the time, especially in the lips, you know. So I'm, I'm working on, on jaw exercises when I'm practicing and, and trying really hard to relax there. But, you know, it might be something different for someone else. Uh, it, the importance is really just awareness and uh, learning slowly how to fix that problem for yourself. Yeah, for sure. A second ago, you mentioned fiddling at concerts with like the wrong chair height or your ergo plays at the wrong spot. Do you have any tips for quickly adapting to new stage settings when things are just like a little bit not the way they are oh, at home? Steve, Steve's this is this is Steve's like this is right up his alley because I mean, this, is the, <laughs> this guy right here, he he is the most diligent when it comes to finding the perfect height of chair and the perfect height of ergo play. And he changes basically every day. He's always experimenting with it. So what do you do, man? Like what, what's, what's your trick? 
I mean, yeah, I don't, know, I don't know if it's my trick. It's that, I mean, I, it's, again, it's something that I realize is very, very important. So I just, I, I prioritize it. Um, but you said it yourself, you know, I'm still changing some things, although I've been pretty much at the same, yeah. same more or less for the past few years now that I think I've, I've found. Um, but, you know, I think I was thinking about being this diligent, but I was reading Ernesto Batetti's autobiography uh, a couple of months ago. And he just simply says, you know, he, he doesn't go like Glenn Gould, Gould style and bring his own chair. But he says, you know, my footstool is 16 inches off the ground and my chair is 29 inches off the ground. Something like that. I forget yeah. what, what the exact measurements were. But he's just like, that's, I will not play my show without that. That's, that's in the rider. You know? uh-huh. that's, that's what I need. <laughs> that's, that's what I need. Yeah. Um, and you know, it's a standard chair height, so it's usually not hard to find down. But, you know, um, just, just last week I was actually on a lower chair than, than usual um and in my first piece it kind of threw me off Mm -hmm. um so i guess um you know uh i think what you need in these cases is you need a plan b um and i think even if you're not a footstool user um having a footstool at your disposal is maybe the easiest like uh adjustable thing i think because there have been times basically as someone who uses a guitar support and a footstool there have been times when um, I start playing and I think, okay, this is what usually works, but the guitar is too low. Mm-hmm. I put the footstool up one more notch. That's a quick two-second fix in a concert, and I'm, I'm better. I'm more aligned to how I usually am. Yeah. The opposite has also happened. Okay, the guitar is too high. I get rid of the footstool. Now it's fine. Or um, even though I don't, again, like to do this uh, – too often, um, I can still play with just a footstool. Yeah. And, you know, again, if the chair is too low. So, so I have my ideal setup, but occasionally I will, again, practice on just a footstool or something else so that I have like a backup plan, mm-hmm. you know? And and then and, and again, that's having the footstool there to go either one notch higher, one notch lower um, has gotten me out of a fix. But the other thing I would say is just get there well in advance, test your chair and make sure it it is fine don't think oh this is okay it'll be fine like adjust it take your time try the other chairs they have there you'll know when you're when it feels right you know sometimes it'll feel okay but you'll know when like this is how i practice Mm -hmm. sometimes it's just right on other times you think ah this is close enough and then again the concert starts and the 10th fret is sort of physically where the ninth fret used to be and everything's thrown off the guitar's at a bigger angle um so yeah just be obsessed about it (laughs) yeah (laughs) I remember at the GFA, Steve wanted um, the bench adjusted. He wanted it turned 43 times in the piano bench. Uh, well, he this exactly. He asked, he asked the people that were going to do it on stage, you know, it's got to be 43. And, uh, and she was like, you, you're joking with me, right? And this was right before we were about to go on to perform, you know. And I, was not joking, I, I watched yeah. the video after and I see them like both of the girls going 43 times on the chair. You know, they're working super hard while the, the person is introducing us. But we played well. And I was, I was, I was super comfortable. I <laughs> sat down and I was like, yep, this is, this is exactly the height I want to play at right now. Yeah. You know, I don't have to do any adjusting. Um, I think learning how to, to play on a piano bench is, is, is pretty good. Obviously, you're not always going to have the luxury of having a piano bench at a venue that you play at. Mm-hmm. But I really agree with Steve's um, comment about the footstool. I was playing with him at the Guitar Society of Toronto last year, and uh, the chairs just were not the right height, and I got somebody to get me a footstool. But I hadn't been practicing with the footstool, um, so I my foot was on and off the footstool throughout the night. And yeah, I played well, but it was not my best playing. And uh, It can really throw things off. It can you throw really, things you off. Really can't, I mean, you can't take it for granted. Yeah. You can't take it for granted. You have to have the plan B. 100%. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. yeah. Uh, maybe one last question, then we'll get into some viewer questions. Um, what are some spaces in the classical world that you think haven't been filled, some niches to occupy or things that people could do in the modern day that uh, would be successful that they aren't doing yet? Man, TJ, your questions are so good. <laughs> You've done this before, it sounds like. These are great questions. I, oh, man, the, the, there are, I think, honestly, there are so many uncharted territories that we have yet to explore in performance spaces. Um, you know, I love playing in non-conventional venues. I love playing in, uh, it, 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 obviously, you know, it's, it's sometimes difficult with the classical guitar because you get into a venue where there's a lot of noise, mm-hmm. so you got to adjust. But, uh, you know, uh, to make our music and our art more accessible to general people, we have to learn to play in, in, in accessible spaces. Mm-hmm. So, you know, Steve and I have learned to amplify 
and have, have amplified quite a bit. Uh, I, I've been doing that uh, much more uh, recently and I used to be much more of a purist and as a result, um, like lost out on opportunities in the past to be able to, to perform. Um, I'm going to the UK in, in October and we're playing 10 concerts that are all going to be in non-traditional venues. Some will be like in the forest. Um, you know, we're going to, wow. we've got, that's cool. We got some like interesting, interesting uh, partnerships with collaborators that are going to put us in these spaces to make music more accessible mm -hmm. to uh, uh, rural audiences and rural communities. Um, but I think those types of endeavors are really cool. And I think it's a great way to bring people that are, you know, maybe a little scared about sitting in a concert hall or sitting down and not saying a word for an hour and a half mm -hmm. kind of thing, you know? Yeah, I don't absolutely. know if that answers your question. Yeah, no, that's, that's great. Yeah, I mean, this is this is something I, I again think about a lot and try to self-analyze and place myself in, in in like in what's happening and like because you know I think I think when I was younger the fact that I was like I don't know I was playing newer rep and doing stuff with electronics I, I viewed myself as more of a progressive kind of uh, artist I wanted to be that way but again you know and I'm a bit older I realize there's a lot about me that is that is love that is quite traditional and quite conservative and I feel like I'm again I'm sort of balancing these worlds and then you ask about stuff that uncharted territory that hasn't been done I mean what I'm seeing at least in a city like Montreal and amongst students now is that um, things are happening there's a lot of the word post-classical is getting thrown around mm -hmm. by one of my students a lot and there's a lot of Again, there's a lot more original music. There's a lot more hybrid genres. There's a lot more uh, presenting this stuff in very unpretentious venues. Yeah. And I see the audiences and they're not the same audiences that would be out at, again, the same artist playing yeah. a traditional program at, at, at a church. So um, while I, I was very, my generation was open to that and we started doing it, I, I, I feel like the next generation are going to be the ones to really bring classical music uh, to this new this hope this new place that I think is very exciting. Mm -hmm. I, I really genuinely believe that uh, that if more people are exposed to this, more of a certain type of people, they will really they will really appreciate it. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I think I think it's happening. Yeah. Okay. Nice. Okay. So the the most important thing everyone's been talking about it since glimpses of your cats have been showing up on and off stream. Could you tell us a bit about your cats? It's like the prime feature right now. <laughs> <laughs> of course, of course. I mean, they're both actually sleeping and cuddling each other right now. Um, I'll pick them up in a moment, though. I'll wake them up and like show everybody. Uh, but uh, before, I'll give you the backstory. So Tony, uh, <laughs> Tony. Uh, Tony, uh, I saw an ad. He was going to be put down. He was in a pound, and someone needed to adopt him uh, before that happened. And he looked cute, so I went and I got him. And he's been my best bud for like uh, twelve years. That's awesome. Um, he's, his health's not too good right now. He's still kicking, but um, he's got some health problems. Yeah. But luckily, many years after that, um, I decided to get a friend for him, whose name is Larry. <laughs> Um, it's a friend for you too, Steve. The, you know. Friend for me too, and yeah, they're they're cuddling right now. So everyone asks if they're brothers because they're two black cats, but they're not. I just introduced them, uh, the younger one. We brought him in a lot later, and yeah, they they're they're super nice guys. They love people. They love each other. Um, and with that, on that note, <laughs> very sweet. <laughs> Come here. Guys. And then while Steve gets Tony and Larry, uh, this little guy over here is Mus. That's my my dude. He's a mix of a Highland Lynx and a, and a Mohawk Bobcat. Oh, look at those Aww. guys. Tony's, Tony's the Tony, one with the tongue. So cute. Yeah, Tony's, Tony's tongue. Well, cute is one word for it. Um, <laughs> you, you can't say that. You look at his tongue and you can't, you, you, there's no way it's not cute. I know. I know. It's cute. Yeah, there's uh, then this is, as you can see. Yeah. This is Edwin. <laughs> I, know, I know we were talking about cats, but, you know, cats... Right. Edwin's welcome to it. In fact, Edwin yeah. is actually, um, he's, he's our tour dog. He came yeah, on tour with us last year. Awesome. <laughs> he was a great tour guide. Guide. Tour buddy. <laughs> Amazing. <laughs> oh. uh, all right. Well, I think that's, that's just about it. It's, I, I don't want to hold you past your, your lesson time. We're just bang on the time right now. I so. mean, it, yeah, sure. I mean, again, if, there's, if there are a few other, other questions. Oh, there, um, there's, there's a few other uh, questions. I don't want to make well, your student have to, have to wait. Well, I think we're in five more minutes. Okay, okay. okay. <laughs> right. Uh, so do you guys have a least favorite hotel chain while touring? <laughs> we're Airbnb guys. We, we like yeah. our Airbnb. Oh, yeah. Okay, nice. But, well, yeah, but we've had some bad Airbnb experiences. We've had some bad Airbnb if you're, if, you're, if you're looking for some, uh, yeah, just some, like, you know, horror stories of where we stayed, uh, I guess the, 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 the most 
shareable or the most, I guess, well, when, when interesting had, interesting when story was when we were recording an album and we in Toronto. So uh, in order to uh, uh, avoid the street noise, we record very late at night. So we get back to our Airbnb at like two two thirty mm-hmm. in the morning, and it had been raining, and the ceiling is caved in in our place. Oh wow! Adam, okay, Adams and, and there Adams are two people in Adams. Airbnb with buckets everywhere trying to like mop it up, and oh, wow. our stuff is everywhere, including our computers, just sitting. Yeah, and, yeah like was, my um, laptop got got destroyed. So yeah, oh man. Yeah, yeah. Uh, ho- ho- hotel chains? No, not really. Okay. We don't really stay. They've been okay. The ones that they yeah. have. Yeah. And the uh, the counterpart to this is uh, how about airlines while while touring? I think I, I know an answer to this one. But <laughs> <laughs> how dare you ask this question? <laughs> too soon. Don't fly United. Yes, too soon. Too soon <laughs> Don't fly United. That's all I have to say. Yeah. Just look up the pictures on Facebook. You'll just yeah. search United. Just the word United and, and Adam's broken guitar will come up. Yeah, <laughs> yeah exactly. Um, but I, I really do like uh, Porter. Okay. I really like Porter. I like, I'm always able to get my guitar in the, in the cabin. Nice. In the, like the, they have a little closet in the front. Uh, Air Canada is pretty good too. Um, but yeah, Porter's been my, my best so far. I don't know about you, Steve. Yeah. I mean, you know, I've had... 90% of the time, most of them are okay. I think if you're, the you know, the question is always how to travel with a guitar. I think if you go early and politely ask or just, you know, just, just, you know, yeah, just, just, just don't be shy, I guess. Um, in my experience, uh, rather than just showing up last minute at the gate, you know, with a guitar and then they have to deal with it when everything's already on, just mm-hmm. let them know early that you're there and that you want to accommodate, but you're yep. looking for some help because your guitar is very valuable. Um, most of them have been understanding. Again, I've had a few stressful ones who were they took their bad day out on the musician. But exactly. Not, not, not too many. Not too you, many. You would actually be surprised. Most people want to help, mm-hmm. um, and because of you know last ten fifteen years, so many musicians have had negative experiences with their instruments. Uh, it's become a pretty mainstream thing. Yeah. Uh, a lot of the airline companies are smarting up to it and starting to uh, to, to to fix their policies to reflect it and. Um, so getting your instrument on board isn't as difficult as it might've used to have been. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Okay. Maybe one last year question. Do you guys have any lesser known classical players that you'd recommend listening to, or maybe some up and comers in the younger generations that you think are worth paying attention to? Oh, Steve has one student. Um, well, TJ, you would have known him when you were at McGill, uh, Emmanuel. Oh yeah. Who, uh, I think is doing some some really incredible things uh his uh, for people who haven't heard his most recent album uh he only has one so far but there will be many emmanuel albums out uh, i'm sure uh, i highly recommend that you go check it out um again a guy yeah. that's yeah. really um it's more yeah. an ambient soundscape style but coming from a classical guitar background yeah right? exactly pretty, pretty cool but you results. know he he doesn't shy away from electric guitar and he, yeah. he he's very good at you know this kind of I don't know if he was the post-classical student you were talking about before, Steve. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Uh, I really think he's he's a big up-and-comer, and uh, but I mean, I, I I can name name off a ton of really great young guitarists. Um, yeah, there's 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 a ton. Um, again, there's a ton of like so many people who I just see they're playing and there's something about their touch or where I just think is really, really special. So that's like a playing thing. But um, I guess like artistically, like I really am, I've been following what Sean Scheiba has been doing. I think that's how you pronounce his name. Sean Scheiba, Mm -hmm. Scottish guitarist, you know, again, a lot of really great interpretations of traditional repertoire, interesting arrangements, uh, really cool music for electric guitar. um, And, you know, some new commissions from some like really, really big, Great composers right now so um he's so prolific because i think the the record deal he has you know he has to put out a lot of content and he's he's doing it at a very fast pace and with such variety and uh it's really it's really fresh for me to see that kind of again high quality coming out and um outside of the guitar circles as much as i love Mm -hmm. the guitar festival circuit and and and, you know the tight-knit world um he is not part of that he's just part of the greater yeah. classical music world that's that's he's, where he's, 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 he's playing at, send it he's yeah he's, he's playing at all world. these all these big venues and you know um i think 
if if that if he is like you know the first exposure that some people who only pay attention to those uh, bigger sort of things are getting, and they're like, oh, this is classical guitar. I think he is a fantastic ambassador. I yeah. think he's just really. Uh, so yeah, I'm, I'm just I'm a fan, and there's yeah. many other young again, many other young players coming up with. I can see similar talent and similar Thatcher, ideas. Thatcher I, I, mm -hmm. Ideas. Oh yeah, him as well artistically. I mean, this guy is. Uh, a true, you know, a true, yeah, just a true original. He's, he's, he's the way he plays, the way he writes, the way he, everything. He's, he's, a, he's an artist, you know. Yeah, so, yeah, that's that's uh, Harrison for people who don't know him, a young yeah, uh, American yeah, guitarist. Another. But most of the stuff that he's outputting is is his original compositions, and and yeah. he he does some with with speech, some with with song, and uh, but the chops are just and the touch is just next level. The guy, is, well, again, and so much influence from like true like American American music forms. You absolutely, know what I mean? like with his classical blues. guitar training, like hitting at yeah. blues and country and all this stuff, and like so tastefully yeah. and Tasteful. so uh, and again so like knowledgeable of the of the idiom. He's not. It's not just like uh, again. It's uh, it's really impressive. It's really impressive. So he's another. He's another that I. Yeah, so I you think don't. There's... You don't have to 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 like the style of music to appreciate what this guy is doing mm -hmm. and to recognize high level innovative uh, talent when you when you see it you know so yeah. Uh, yeah. another guy to, to to definitely look up yeah yeah awesome nice all right well with that why don't we call it there uh one other thing to look forward to two things actually uh, one uh steve and adam are releasing their new album this year lyric pretty pretty exciting and also they'll be coming to vancouver on april 27th so that's something that you can look forward to. And if you're on the BC um, area as well, there's a whole string of concerts that they'll be doing here. So collaboration with Muse West and the Vancouver Guitar Society will be, uh, yeah, it'll be a really, really big thing. So if you want to, you can yeah. check out VancouverGuitar.org and find tickets for the concerts, either live streamed or in person. And you can also check out their respective websites to find out some of their uh, concert tour dates and maybe maybe you'll just get lucky and be uh be in the right place at the right time but <laughs> right yeah anyways thank you guys a... so much yeah oh sorry just one one last thing well, we're giving a class on the 28th as well in vancouver oh really perfect interested yeah awesome so yeah master class on the 28th too so double chance nice. to uh, see these two uh canadian uh, guitar legends <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, thanks, guys, so much for being here. And uh, thanks, TJ. Yeah, take care. Yeah. It's great to chat with you, TJ. Yeah, thanks so likewise. much. Okay. Bye-bye, guys. Bye-bye. Bye, guys.